Victorian Periodical Parade. Our Lady of Hate, the short stories of Catherine Lord, edited by Johnny Maines, and read aloud by Owen Curtis. That Terrible Christmas Eve, published in The Courier, December 28th, 1892. Tell you a story, my dear. Why, you know all mine by heart already. Set aside from active work, old country fool. house, like the old fairy in Sleeping Beauty. There she did mysterious pieces of needlework and mending, and here came all the cross and the delicate and the dull children of the house to a city of refuge. Nurse Preston had cures for every childish malady and trouble, and it was our highest delight to listen to her story and turn over her treasures as she called a store of odds and ends, useful and ornamental, which she had accumulated around her. Therefore, on this special day, when the rain kept us all indoors and amusements flagged, we, myself and two sisters, naturally set off for Nurse Preston's chamber. Tell you a story, my dears. Why, you know all mine by heart already. I don't know what to say, proceeded the kind old soul, laying down her work with a puzzled expression, for a wet Christmas following the attack of the measles had made us very frequent visitors to Nurse Preston of late, and her stock of stories had been nearly exhausted. Tell us something about yourself, Nursey, said little Mabel, climbing on her knee. How did you first come to know Mamma? You've told us so much about her, but you never told us how you first knew her. Oh, said Nurse Preston, stroking the child's golden hair. As I come to think of it, my knowing your dear Mamma, or leastwise her parents, for she, sweet lamb, was not born then, grew out of one of the most terrible frights I ever had in my life. Tell us, tell us! We cried in chorus, for the history of a terrible fright sounded most inviting, and after coughing and settling herself comfortably in her chair, Nurse began her tale. And after coughing and settling herself comfortably in her chair, Nurse began her tale. Oh, well, young ladies, you must know that I was born a long way from here, right away in Devonshire. Father was bailiff to Sir George Hardy, your grandfather, and he, father I mean, and I and my grandmother all lived in a snug cottage together. I had lost my mother, as you have, my dears, but at the time I am talking of, I was a tall lass of twenty or so, and quite able to keep father's house. We were fairly well to do. People worked harder and spent less in those days, I think. And ours was a very happy home. Father had been bailiff for a great number of years, longer than Sir George had been master at the hall, and was greatly trusted and looked up to. It was the day before Christmas, and as I was at work in our neat kitchen preparing for the Christmas dinner, Father came in and took a canvas bag out of his breast pocket. See here, lass, he said. I must find a safe place to lay this away, for tis more money than I care to ride across the moor with tonight. Money of yours, Father? I exclaimed in surprise. Nay, nay, where should I get a bag of gold from? Tis money of Sir George's that I am to lay out for him at the New Year Fair. A pretty penny there is in that bag. I was loath to take it, but Sir George is mad to buy a horse that is said to be worth, I don't know what, and thinks I shall make a better bargain for it than he will. So as I was at the hall today, he gave me the money before he left for London, and I am to bid the ready penny for the beast. But I don't care to ride with the bag of gold tonight, so find a place to put it away, my girl. Poor Sir George, your grandfather, was always so careless of his money, my dears although in this case it was safe enough in father's hands. I looked at the bag with curiosity, a little mixed with awe. I had never seen so much money in my life before. Then I glanced about for a safe place to put the treasure. We had nothing valuable to take care of, and therefore had no places of special security. This will do, said father, opening mother's empty work box, which was kept as a sacred relic on the dresser. You can put the box in the oak chest yonder with your Sunday's finery. After all, the money's safe enough anywhere in this house, for nobody knows I have it. Only I'm bound to ride over to Taunton tonight, and don't care to be well worth robbing. Must you go, father? I asked, looking rather anxiously at the chest, where the workbox and its precious contents had just been deposited. 
Of course I must, foolish lass. Doesn't your sister expect me certain sure? And if I fail, won't she be scared fit to kill herself? My only sister had married about a year before, and was living in Taunton. She had been ailing of late, and father had promised to spend Christmas Eve with her, returning home early the next day. He was to have ridden over on this afternoon, but Sir George's summons to the hall had detained him. Still, rather than disappoint Phoebe, he would start now, late as it was. There was nothing unusual in my being left thus alone with grandmother. Father was often detained late at fairs and obliged to sleep away from home. Yet somehow the thought of being left in charge, as it were, of this money, such a large sum as it appeared to me, made me uncomfortable. Bless the girl, said father, laughing as I told him of my misgivings. Do ye think I told all the village that I had the bag of gold? Nobody but our two selves and Sir George knows anything about it. So give me my coat, lass, and let's hear no more of these maggots. As I turned to reach down his thick riding coat, I started. Surely there was a face, a man's face, looking in at the window. The evening was growing dark, and the light of the fire made the inside of our rooms distinct from outside. Anyone standing there could have seen Father throw the bag into my lap and open it to show me its golden contents. Father, there's a strange man looking in, I cried with sudden alarm. Father strode to the door and opened it suddenly. Yes, sure enough, a stranger stood on the threshold. What's your business with us? asked Father rather sharply. The man, who was a dark, undersized fellow, shabbily dressed, with a furtive look and a countenance I did not like, raised his cap as he answered submissively. Please, your honour. I'm a poor peddler and strange to these parts. I should be glad to hear of a place where I could get a night's lodging. This ain't an inn. If you keep along this road another mile, you'll come to one. The Black Boar, said Father, preparing to close the door. Another mile, repeated the peddler. And I be terrible footsore already. Your Honor couldn't just let me have a place to lie down for the night air. Clean straw would do, or a couple of chairs in this kitchen. I'd pay for my lodging, or, if that would give offence, the young lady there might please herself out of my pack and welcome. I tell you, you can't stay here, said Father. I'm obliged to ride to Taunton tonight, and I can't leave my girl alone with a stranger in the house. I am sure Father repented those words before they were well out of his mouth, but he was a quick-speaking man, and I think he was a little put about at the idea of the strange man looking in the window, perhaps having seen the money. So without thinking, he let out what he had certainly better have kept to himself. There was no need to tell the man that Granny and I were to be all alone that night. It may have been only fancy, but I certainly thought I saw the man's face brighten at Father's speech, and perhaps Father thought it too, for he said rather sharply, Well, friend, you've had your answer and you may as well be off, and good even to you. Stay a bit, said the peddler, in a hesitating voice, as if he were doubtful what to say. If... You won't take me in for the night. Maybe you'd let me leave my pack here. It's mortal heavy to carry another mile, and besides, I might not find safe quarters for it in a little inn. I'm a poor man, your honour, and couldn't afford to lose my pack. Could be a real kindness to let me leave it here for the night. And I've a good stock of ribbons. And I've got as good a stock of ribbons as any peddler in the country, and the young lady shall have a choice in payment. My daughter is no young lady, and we don't want to be paid for doing a small civility, said Father. He was a kindly man, and hated to seem churlish. For that matter, I'm sorry we can't take you in. However, we can manage your pack. If so, be that you like trusting it in the hands of strangers, hand it along. I laid it down just under the edge while I came to knock on the door, said the man, shuffling off quickly, while Father turned to me and said, I don't quite like his looks. But anyway, there can be no harm in taking care of his pack. The man must have left his pack some way off to judge by the time he was gone to fetch it. At last he returned, half carrying, half dragging what looked like a large sack. Why, however could you carry a pack of that size? exclaimed Father, as the man stepped inside and deposited his burden in the darkest corner of the kitchen. It ain't so heavy as it looks replied the man, who was nevertheless out of breath with his exertions. But I've been looking for some things in it, and did it up untidy-like. 
However, I'll get it in shipshape tomorrow. Good night, Your Honor, and many thanks to you. And he went away. Do you think he saw the money? I asked anxiously. That money runs in your head, lass. No, I don't suppose he did. But anyway, it don't matter. You've good locks and bolts and stout shutters between you and him. Besides, if he was a thief, he wouldn't be trusting us with his pack. Fasten up well tonight and don't get fancies in your head. At the time I was speaking of, my dears, over fifty years ago, yeoman's daughters like I was, left nerves and fancies to find lady, as we had no time for such nonsense. So I saw our father off and bolted up, well closing the strong shutters over the window, and got granny to bed. And it was only when I sat down to my knitting again that my thoughts began to dwell on the ill-looking stranger. We were thrifty people then, and I never thought of wasting candles when I could work by the firelight. So I sat knitting in the chimney corner, and the flames flickered and danced, making the middle of the room bright, but leaving the rest in darkness. I don't know how it was, but my eyes kept wandering to that large bundle lying indistinct in the corner. It was such an oddly shaped pack for a peddler to carry. What could be in it? Linen goods, perhaps. They would be heavy and look bulky like that. But how unusual to carry them in a sack, for such the outer covering certainly was. It was no concern of mine, but I felt such a strange, unaccountable curiosity about that package. At last I fairly laid down my work and went up to the dark corner to look at it closely. Yes, it was certainly a sack, tied up carefully with rope, but as I looked at it, was it only the flicker of the firelight? I fancied it moved. I stood staring with all my might and keeping as still as a mouse, and presently there was no doubt about it. Something inside stirred ever so gently, but yet unmistakably. The contents of that sack were alive. My heart beat so that I could hardly stand, but I crept noiselessly to the sack and laid my ear near it. Yes, I could distinctly hear a cautious, smothered breathing. I don't know how I managed to stifle the scream that rose to my lips, but luckily for me I did stifle it, though I turned sick with terror. There were Granny and I locked in with some desperate ruffian whose accomplice, the pretended peddler, had thus gained him admission to the house. Doubtless the man who looked in at the window had seen the bag of gold and laid the scheme to obtain possession of it. The man in the sack was only waiting till he supposed we were upstairs to get free of his covering and make off with the money. In one instant, I thought of bolting myself upstairs with Granny and letting the robber do this. But the next moment I remembered that this would be very unfaithful to Sir George. The fatal money was in my keeping, and I was bound to take charge of it. To carry it upstairs would be useless. The man would only pursue me in search of it, and the fright would kill Granny. I have heard that people say that desperation makes cowards brave. My terror put an idea into my head. Over the chimney-piece hung an old blunderbuss. It was not loaded. I felt thankful it was not, or I should have been afraid of touching it, and I believe it was quite out of repair. However, it would serve my purpose. I reached it down and began talking as if to myself, though I wonder I could get the words out. Dear me, I said, as distinctly as I could speak, so that the man could hear every word. It's a good thing father has left this loaded gun in case of anyone coming into the house. I wonder if I could fire it. I should just like to try. And I clicked the lock as if I were cocking the piece. It was a sad falsehood to say that the gun was loaded, but what could I do? I walked up to the sack, gun in hand. I'll try it here, he said. Don't believe there's anything to hurt in the pack. Anyway, I'll risk it. Tis such a large mark to aim at. The words were hardly out of my mouth before the sack nearly jumped on end, and I stifled a voice to cry, Hold hard! Do you want to commit a murder? So I was not mistaken. How I trembled. But there was no time for that, for I saw just the point of a knife gleam through the canvas, and I knew the man was trying to cut his way out. If he did that, it was all over with. I've a loaded gun here, I said, repeating the falsehood, I am sorry to say. And if you move hand a foot, I'll fire. Lie down and keep still, or you're a dead man. The sack fell down again suddenly, and a rather frightened voice began to swear and protest. I'll go away quietly without hurting a hair of your heads. If I would only let him out of the sack. 
but this, you may believe, I was not fool enough to listen to. There was a large, deep, old-fashioned cupboard along one side of the room with a diamond-shaped hole in the upper panel. Into one end of this big closet I thrust my prisoner, sack and all, dragged him along as best I could, and threatened to shoot him if he resisted. Being tied up in the dark, he was quite in my power. I would have put him out of doors, for I could have trusted to the strength of our bolts and shutters to keep him out when he was once there, but I dreaded lest the other man might be lurking near and might rush in as I opened the door. I locked the cupboard door, dragged all the furniture I could move against it, and then sat down, and for the only time in my life fainted away. I recovered to find myself lying on the floor, feeling very dizzy and confused, but I soon recollected myself. Well had the man safe under lock and key, but I still felt uneasy, supposing he managed to break out. I have often heard father say that you might tell a lie so often that you believed it yourself at last, and I really think I had talked so much about the gun being loaded that I had come to look upon it as a great protection, although it was about as good as a stick of firewood. I sat with it in my hand hour after hour watching that cupboard and every now and then calling through the keyhole of the door that I was sitting ready to fire if the robber tried to break out. I believe, poor wretch, he was frightened as I, for he kept quite still, although I fancy I heard all sorts of noises, movements in the cupboards, steps outside the window, all just fancy and nothing else. But it was not wonderful that I fancied anything, sitting there alone with the thief in the cupboard, Granny was asleep upstairs, and I did not want to disturb her, so I waited alone. Time passed by. It must have been about twelve or one o'clock when I actually did hear a step outside the door. I was in such a worked-up state that I screamed aloud. Then came a loud knocking at the door and a cry, in a well-known and, oh, how welcome a voice. Polly! Polly! Tis Joe! Let me in! Is anything the matter? Joe, my dears, was a young farmer who had been very civil to me for a long time. I liked him very well, but I held him off, rather, for I was not going to fall into any man's mouth like a ripe plum. But now I was too glad to hear his voice to stand on anything, and after cautiously unbarring the door a little, to make sure it was really Joe, I fairly threw it open, and, well, I do believe I ran straight into his arms. It was such a comfort to see him standing there, strong and handsome, and looking fit to protect me against anything. Joe soon understood everything, and after he had quieted me a little, for now the danger was over, I was sobbing as if my heart would break, he bade me wrap up, and he would take me to his mother's in the village and then come back with help to secure the thief. But I could not leave Granny, and it was impossible to take her out in the cold night air, so it ended in Joe's running at the top of his speed for the constables while I sat before the cupboard door. Our cottage stood nearly a mile from the village, but Joe was back in a wonderfully short time, and then he and the constables opened the door and took out my prisoner. He had cut his way out of the sack and lay huddled up in the corner, half stupefied through want of air and looking miserable enough. Although he went away very quickly with the men, I felt indeed thankful that I had detected him in time to secure him, for a villainous-looking fellow he was, with a large knife in his hand. Oh, I can see him now. But why would your friend Joe come to the house so late at night? asked Adela, who was of an inquiring turn of mind. Well, my dear, Joe was looking after me, as I said, and had happened to meet my father riding to Taunton, and father had been speaking of the strange man who had asked for a lodging, and how frightened I had seemed at it. Joe kept thinking about this all evening and somehow got restless. He did not like to think of me being troubled about anything, but he was fool enough to walk down late at night when he ought to have been abed, just to see that all was right at our house. Then he heard me scream and knocked at the door. And what became of the thief? Oh, he and his friend were both taken. They were part of a gang of burglars who had come down to rob some of the large houses about our neighbourhood. As I thought, one of them had seen Father open the bag of gold as he looked in through the window, and when he could not get into the house himself he just tied up his mate in a sack, and pretended that this was a peddler's pack. A great escape we had, for these very men had murdered an old woman at one house they had robbed some months before, and warrants were out against them. 
what became of them at last? One was hanged, poor wretch. The other, who had saved his neck by giving evidence, the pretended peddler, was sent across the seas. I hope he repented and did better in another country. But oh, my dears, the fuss everyone made about me afterwards. I'm sure I don't know why. Father said I had saved my granny's life and Sir George's money by my courage, and that he was proud of his daughter. And Sir George, though he was such a naughty gentleman, came down himself when he returned home after Christmas to thank me, while Joe was more foolish about me than ever. And when Joe and I were married some months later, Sir George gave our wedding dinner at the hall, and a noble one it was. Half the tenants were there. Sir George himself came down and made a speech and spoke of what he called my great courage and fidelity, and then he gave me a purse with just fifty gold guineas, half what the bag had held, begging I would accept this mark of his esteem as a wedding gift. I felt quite confused and ashamed at so much fuss being made about me, for although Joe said that most women in my place would have just made themselves safe upstairs and let the thief carry off the money, I do not think any one would have been so unfaithful of things in their care. For my part, I was always rather ashamed to think of the lies I told about the gun being loaded, but I was so terribly frightened, and thought my only chance was to make the man believe I could shoot him. But you haven't told us how you came to be Mama's nurse, said little Mabel. Ah, my dear, said Nurse, a shade falling on her kind, cheerful face. I only had my Joe for five short years. Five years I was a happy wife, and then I lost the best, the kindest husband that ever breathed. There was fever in our village, and my Joe caught it. I buried him in my little girl, our only little girl, in one week. Then I went back to live with father. Phoebe and her husband had come to him after I married, though he didn't really need me. Then Sir George's young wife, who had been so good to me in my trouble, came and asked me if I would like to be nurse to the baby that was expected at the hall. She knew how I loved children, and that I understood a good deal about the care of them, and she thought, dear, kind lady, that it would turn my sad heart from dwelling always on my own losses, if I had another little one to love. So I went to the hall after your mamma was born, and it was a real home to me, and I only left it when my dear young lady married and brought me here with her. You are to live here always now, Papa says, said Adela. I hope I may, my dears. I saw your dear mamma the day she was born. I dressed her for her wedding, and I hope to lay her in her coffin. I love you all as if you were my own children, and I shall be sad indeed to leave you now. I am too old a woman, my dears, to expect to live to see you all grown up, but I hope when you do you will all be as sweet and as good and as gentle as my dear lady your mamma was. Miss Mabel has her golden hair, and Miss Adela her soft voice, and I think you, Miss Lucy, are most like her in face, but I hope you all have a sweet temper and a loving heart. My dears, good comes out of evil, but for that dreadful night's terror I might never have been Joe's wife, or known my sweet young mistress and her children. Victorian Periodical Parade Victorian Periodical Parade